Hello, everyone. Welcome to the beginning of chemical kinetics. We're all finished with thermodynamics. I want to remind you of your quiz next week, which will be scheduled during your tutorial time slot. The quiz will cover all of the thermodynamics, as well as naming chemical compounds and writing formulas for chemical compounds. So that's what the quiz will involve. The quiz is worth 7.5% of your total mark. There are two quizzes which total 15% of your total mark, as was indicated in the syllabus. So to begin, so far we've studied thermodynamics. And thermodynamics effectively explains why chemical reactions occur. It enables us to tell whether or not they're spontaneous or not. We can do that by finding the value of Gibbs energy. If it's negative, it's spontaneous. Or we could find the entropy change for the universe, which, if it's positive, tells us the reaction is spontaneous. It also tells us whether the reaction proceeds in the forward or reverse direction, as written. However, thermodynamics doesn't tell us anything about how those reactions occur. It doesn't tell us whether there are steps in those chemical reactions. It doesn't tell us whether the reaction goes really fast or really slow. And there's no simple way of determining that. You simply have to analyze the chemical reaction itself. So chemical kinetics, on the other hand, tell us these things. They tell us the factors involved in influencing the speed of the chemical reaction. And it's critical, of course, to designing and implementing a process for which we can commercially produce chemicals that are produced in chemical reactions. <clears throat> Here's a graph showing energy changes over time. The domain of thermodynamics is to show us the relationship between the reactants and products. It doesn't really tell us much about what is happening in the interim. From this particular graph, we can see that it's exothermic because the products have less stored energy than the reactants. But we don't really know what kind of steps are involved in going from reactants to products. We don't know how fast it goes. <clears throat> These intermediate steps that we are going to learn about, uh, we will discuss in the next few lectures. They really do matter and they influence the chemical reaction. Keep in mind that chemical reactions can happen very, very quickly. In fact, we now have technology that can actually analyze the progress of certain simple chemical reactions in femtoseconds. And consider what a femtosecond is. It's one times 10 to the minus 15 seconds, an incredibly short period of time. In fact, one femtosecond is to a second, what one second is to 100 million years. So that tells you how small those intervals of time are that we can actually uh, glimpse into during these chemical changes. We can do this because of the uh, advent of high speed lasers, which of course radiate a chemical mixture with energy and electrons can absorb those bursts of energy and re-radiate them in characteristic quantities which can be used to identify specific intermediates within a reaction mixture. <clears throat> now consider the reaction that you're looking at on the screen here. What we see is a, two beakers, one on the left, one on the right. They're both the same substances. Which beaker do you think is going at a faster rate? The one on the left, the one on the right. We can analyze some of the macro properties that are obvious to us. For instance, we can look at the bubbles that are present in these beakers. We can look at the quantity of those bubbles, the size of the bubbles. We can look at the interfaces between the liquid and the atmosphere and see if there are any differences. And hopefully we can come to a kind of a simple conclusion as to which of these do you think is going faster? Well, I would say since there's more bubbles and bigger bubbles on the right, and the fact it looks more violent, and the fact that there's steam emerging, some kind of vapor is emerging from that particular beaker, it looks like to me the one on the right is going faster. If it's just a boiling process going on, it looks like the one on the right is boiling faster than the one on the left. So the reaction rate, of course, would be faster for the one on the right than the one on the left, and we could speculate as to what's causing that. Perhaps there's boiling chips at the bottom here. 
that are absorbing heat energy and re-radiating re -radiating them uh, the energy faster than it here. Who knows? We can't really tell that. I'm just speculating. Let's consider a simple chemical reaction here. Actually, not a simple chemical reaction, but a but a physical change from from diamond to graphite. So when we look at diamond and graphite and compare those, is does this reaction happen spontaneous? The diamond suddenly change into graphite. Well, I certainly hope not. My wife would certainly not be too, be too happy if the diamond ring I gave her suddenly turned into a piece of graphite. I don't see too many women walking around showing off their ring that looks like a piece of graphite. But when we look at the delta G for this reaction, we can determine that delta G has an extremely high negative value, which seems to indicate there is a great um, spontaneity to this. But no, that's not the case. Diamond is a highly organized substance. Each diamond, each carbon atom in a diamond crystal is covalently bonded to four neighbors. In graphite, the rings of carbon atoms, if you compare, one carbon atom is linked to three of its neighbors. There are electrons that are free to roam between these layers in, in graphite. It seems to indicate that graphite is indeed more random than diamond. There are more microstates possible within graphite than within diamond at the same temperature. So the entropy is indeed increasing when you go from diamond to graphite because diamond is more highly organized, but it doesn't happen spontaneously. Why not? Here's another chemical change that we're all familiar with. Hydrogen reacting with oxygen, turning into water. We know that this reaction happens very slowly unless some change happens. For instance, if I introduce a catalyst into the mixture or I introduce a spark, I suddenly change the rate of that reaction to one that's very, very quick. I'm going to show you an example of that here uh, in this particular example here. Here's a professor performing this reaction. And you can see that reaction once initiated by a little spark, certainly happens very, very quickly. So some reactions happen really fast, some happen really slow. For instance, rusting is a process that is continuous and it happens at a fairly slow pace. What controls the rate of chemical reactions? That's just one of the questions that we will look at in future lectures. So some reactions are spontaneous and some are not. Some happen fast, some are fairly slow. Let's consider another reaction here. We're gonna look at the oxidation of methanoic acid. Methanoic acid uh, is a carboxylic acid, you might remember. It's a C carbon atom, double bonded to an oxygen atom, single bonded to another oxygen atom, which is bonded to a hydrogen atom. It's a carboxyl functional group. It's, a, it's the simplest of acids. It's also called, um, in addition to methanoic acid, it's also called formic acid, two, two names. The name that I would recommend you remember is the methanoic acid, since it's got one carbon, it starts with meth. Since it's an acid, it, it is oic acid. We're gonna learn this later on in the course when we talk about organic chemistry. So we're oxidizing the methanoic acid into carbon dioxide and, and releasing the hydrogen ions. We're making bromide ions. And is there a way to determine how fast this reaction goes? Well, it turns out there is. The bromine aqueous is really liquid bromine dissolved in a solution of water. It's highly colored. And we can study the rate at which this reaction proceeds by looking at the obvious change in the color over time. And it looks like over time, this reaction has just um, gone to completion because there is no liquid bromine or aqueous bromine in the liquid water. The color uh, tells us the progress with, with which this reaction is happening. Now, for sake of convenience and just demonstrating it, this happens in one container, but over time, we have different levels of the reaction mixture displayed all at once. That's not really what happens. It really happens in one beaker, and the color changes over time. 
And I'm sure you could probably find it on YouTube if you search for it. Now, is the reaction ha uh, faster at the start or at the end? What do you think? Well, common sense uh, says that the reaction will happen fastest at the start because that's where you have the maximum number of bromine particles moving around in the water. The more bromine particles moving around in the water, the higher the probability of collisions with the methanoic acid particles. And therefore, the reaction would appear to uh, uh, proceed fastest at the start and slowly decrease over time as the quantity of reacting particles decreases. So some chemicals react, as I said, extremely quickly, and some react very slowly. There's no simple rule to find out when you look at a balanced chemical equation, you can't tell whether it's a fast reaction or a slow reaction just looking at it. Now, let's look at a graph here that shows the number of molecules over time of substance A and substance B. Would you say this is a reaction that involves A changing to B or B changing into A? What do you think? Common sense says you started with 40 molecules of A, you started with zero B. So it looks like A is indeed changing into B over time. We could calculate the rate at which this reaction is happening by using instantaneous rates. Instantaneous rates are very effective tools for us to use to monitor the change in reaction rates over time. We can draw tangents to points on a curve, and the slope of that tangent effectively gives us the instantaneous rate at the point where the tangent touches the curve. In this case, at 10 seconds, this would tell us the rate at which A is changing. Further on, at 40 seconds, that's where the tangent is touching. You can see that the slope in this case, which is rise over run, the run, for the same run, you're getting a smaller rise. So the rate appears to be decreasing for A changing into B. Similarly, when I look at B and I draw a tangent at a certain point in time, we can see the slope of the tangent is changing over time. The rate at which B is forming is, mac is greater at the start than at the end as we use up the A. Note the rate of disappearance of A and the formation of B are both decreasing over time. How do we know which of the reactants, which of the substances are reactants and which are products? Again, I mentioned that obviously. Uh, a, there's 40 molecules of A at the start. There's none of B. B is increasing over time. It's a product. A is decreasing over time. It's a reactant. Reactants are always consumed. Products are always produced. Let's look at how we measure the rate of a chemical reaction. We can use an analogy of a speed of a car. We can measure the rate at which a car is moving by looking at the change in distance over time. Well, we can do the same thing in a chemical reaction, but instead of looking at the change in distance, we're gonna look at the change in the concentration. The concentration usually being in moles per liter, which can be represented as mole per liter or capital M, which represents mole per liter, or we can deal with mini mole per liter if it's a dilute solution or it's a substance present in small quantities. And we're gonna compare the change in the concentration over time. That's gonna give us an average reaction rate. Let's consider this chemical reaction. NO2 reacts with carbon monoxide, so nitrogen dioxide. I'm using the, uh, the simple system for naming that uses prefixes that you're required to know for your quiz. We use it with two nonmetals, nitrogen dioxide, carbon monoxide, nitrogen monoxide, carbon dioxide. We could also come up with alternative names using oxidation states. Since oxygen is always minus two, in this case, this could be nitrogen four oxide. This could be carbon two oxide. This could be nitrogen two oxide. This could be carbon four oxide. Those are all alternative names to those substances using both prefixes and oxidation states for the first element in the formula. Either are acceptable. Now suppose I had a method of detecting the presence of NO over time. 
NO being the nitrogen two oxide. <clears throat> it's also called nitric oxide. Now we could have just as easily monitored the production of CO2 or the disappearance of CO or NO2. Typically you pick a substance that's simply easy to monitor and that's the one that you're gonna go with. So in this case, we're gonna look at NO for a reference. Here's a graph of that change over time. We can see that the graph shows the change in concentration of NO in moles per liter. And we can see that that change is being expressed as a function of time. There are different ways of looking at chemical reaction rates. We can look at average rates, or we can look at instantaneous rates. So an average rate would look at a time period from, in this case, if we look at the time period from 50 seconds to 150 seconds, we could look at and measure the average rate over that time frame by the slope of a secant. The secant, again, starts at one point on the curve, finishes at another point on the curve. So at 150 seconds, we can look at the concentration of NO, 0 0.0288. At 50 seconds, we could look at the concentration of NO, which was in moles per liter of 0 0.0160. And we can now calculate the rise, this distance, divided by the run, this distance, and come up with an average rate. And here's the calculation as shown in the little box here, the average rate would be the difference in those concentrations, 0 0.0288 moles per liter minus 0 0.0160 moles per liter over the time frame 150 seconds to 50 seconds. We end up with an answer if mole in moles per liter per second. That's the average rate. Now, if we were going to look at the instantaneous rates, we could draw a series of tangents to different points on the curve. And hopefully you can see that the slope of the tangents are steadily decreasing over time. As we use up reacting molecules, the, the rate of the reaction is decreasing. So an instantaneous rate, to show you how this is done, we're gonna look at the instantaneous rate at 150 seconds. We draw a tangent that touches that point at one location. And we find the concentration of NO at one end of the tangent, and we compare it to the concentration at the other end of the tangent. Being aware, of course, the time frame this happened over, the time frame this happened over was from 200 seconds to 100 seconds. When we do the math and take the difference in the concentrations at those times for this particular tangent, we get 7.7 .7 times 10 to the minus five moles per liter per second, an instantaneous rate at 150 seconds. We could just as easily have found the instantaneous rate at any location. Another example, consider this reaction. We're looking at uh, BrNO, changing into bromine and NO, nitrogen two oxide. The concentrations of the reactants and products are given from time zero through different seconds of the reaction. We can see that we started out with no bromine and NO at the beginning of the reaction. We can see we only started out with BrNO and the concentration given in this particular relationship is in moles per liter. Capital M represents moles per liter. Now, sometimes an equilibrium is reached in which no change is happening, but in this particular example, we don't reach an equilibrium. How do we know that? Because the BRNO is completely consumed. There's none left. So if there's none of the BRNO left, it means this reaction went to completion. That's indicated by the arrow pointing in one direction but we could study also reactions involving equilibria, and we will later on. So from the graph, we can see I've color-coded this. We have 
NO is in blue, BR2 is in red, and BRNO is in green. Now, find the rate of the reaction for these three substances at a time one and a half seconds using the tangent method. We are going to construct tangents for all three substances at time one and a half seconds. So we can construct a tangent there for BRNO. We can construct a tangent here for bromine. And we can construct a tangent here for NO. And we can take rise over run to find the rates. When we do that for BRNO, we can see that the slope of the tangent indicates the rate of the chemical reaction. And BRNO is being consumed in this reaction. <clears throat> Similarly, we can find the slope of the tangent at B to find the rate at which BR2, the bromine, is being produced. And the rate of production of NO can also be found using the tangent at A. Performing those calculations, we get these answers. And keep in mind, if you were to do this on your own, you might get a slightly different answer, which is acceptable given the fact it's a graph and there's no additional lines to use we only have to go by these scales given on the graph. So there is a margin of error associated with the data itself that determines the number of significant digits involved. So the tangent at A, or the rate of production of NO, was found 0 0.210 moles per liter per second. For bromine, it was found to be 0 0.105 moles per liter per second. And for the consumption of BRNO, it was also found to be 0 0.210 mole per liter per second, the slopes of each of those tangents. I'm gonna put them on the curve now, so you get an idea of what the values are in comparison. And let's just inspect this chemical equation to see, does this data make sense? Seems to me the negative sign is indicating that the BRNO is being consumed. It's decreasing in quantity over time. It's also producing NO at the same rate. Notice the, the balanced chemical equation shows the same number, same coefficient for BRNO and NO. Therefore, the rates appear to be the same, except they're opposite to each other. One is negative because it's being consumed, the BRNO, the other is being produced, so it's, um, since the quantities are the same, the rates are the same, but, but opposite, consumed and produced. And the rate of bromine, it looks like it's being produced at half the rate that the NO is being produced because we're only making one mole of bromine for every two moles of NO. So those numbers make sense to me. I hope they do to you as well. The problem with the above calculations, however, is it leads to three different answers. And when we study chemistry, we like to kind of make things a little simpler. To make things a little simpler, we want a reaction rate that deals with the reaction as written. So we're gonna talk about the rate for the reaction, not necessarily for the reaction of which, the reaction rate at which BRNO is being consumed or the reaction rate at which Br2 is being produced or NO is being produced. We want one number for all of that. So to remedy this, scientists came up with a simple system where we use a weighting factor using the stoichiometric coefficients in the balanced equation. They use a positive sign to indicate that the substance is being produced, and they use a negative sign to indicate the substance is being consumed. Makes sense. Um, IUPAC recommends that we use the name nu, this Greek letter, as a weighting factor. And that nu is based on the stoichiometric coefficients in the balanced equation. So the weighting factor for BRNO would be minus two. The weighting factor for bromine would be plus one. For NO would be plus two. So each weighting factor is equal in value to the coefficients in the balanced equation, 
And that's a positive sign for products and a negative sign for reactants. That's the consistent approach we're going to take. So if I have a generalized equation of A, A moles of A plus B moles of B producing C moles of C and D moles of D, the overall instantaneous rates can be determined using rate changes. So it's one over minus A because the rate, uh, weighting factor for A is minus A, one over minus A, which can be simplified to minus one over A, DA, DT. For B, similarly, it's one over minus B, DB, DT. For C, it would be one over C, DC, DT. And for D, would be one over D, DT, DT. Now, all these DA, DTs, DB, DTs, et cetera, all are instantaneous rates in moles per liter per second for this data based on the tangents that are drawn at an instant in time. Now, we can ensure that we'll get the same rate from any of the tangents by using these weighting factors. Another way of getting the same answer is to simply look at the substance present in the balanced equation, which is present in one mole quantity. So we know the overall rate for the chemical equation as shown is going to be the same as the rate at which bromine, Br2, is being produced because it's present as one mole. And we know the rate of production of NO will be twice as great. And the rate of BRNO will be minus twice as great because it's being consumed. And I hope that's another simple way of analyzing and looking at the information that I've presented here to you. So for an overall instantaneous rate at one and a half seconds, we could say for BRNO, the overall rate the instantaneous rate at one and a half seconds will be one over minus two dBrNO over dT. And the rate, again, if we look at it, was minus 2.10 moles per liter per second divided by two by minus two. Sorry, the weighting factor is 0 0.105 moles per liter per second. We could do the same with Br2. Because Br2 is present in one mole, it's the weighting factor is one. One over one dBr2 dt is simply 0 0.105 mole per liter per second. For NO, it would be one over two dNO dt, which is one half of 2. Uh, 0 0.210, which is 0 0.105 mole per liter per second. Notice again, Using the weighting factor, new, we can arrive at the same rate for all reactants and products. So if you know the overall instantaneous rate, you know the rate of appearance or disappearance of any of the participants in the chemical reaction. The bromine is appearing because it's a product, as is the NO, and the BRNO is disappearing. Let's look at going the other way. Suppose the overall instantaneous rate for the reaction as written is 0 0.105 moles per liter per second. What's the rate of consumption of BRNO? Well, we can see the weighting factor is minus two. So we can get the answer by saying the rate will be one over minus two dBRNO dt. Therefore, dBRNO dt is equal to minus two times the rate. So minus two times the rate gives us an answer of minus 0 0.210 moles per liter per second for the consumption of BRNO. This means that BRNO is being consumed at 0 0.210 mole per liter per second. I'm going to clarify here as well that you keep in mind you can indicate whether a substance is a reactant or a product by using the words consumed. We can notice here as well, we showed it as a positive value because we use the word consumed. If you say the BRNO is being consumed, you can change the quantity from a negative to a positive. If, however, you're just talking about the overall rate of reaction, without using the word consumed, you're gonna need to use the negative sign. So I will accept either in, as an answer, 
to a problem given to you on a quiz or a midterm or final exam. I want to now discuss rate laws in general. Chemical kinetics is largely focused on the relationships between concentration of reactants and products on the one hand and the rate of the chemical reaction or elapsed time on the other. So we're going to look at both of those things as we study kinetics. The mathematical expression of the relationship is often referred to as the rate law or rate equation. There are two types of rate laws that we will look at. We're going to look at a differential rate law, which shows the relationship between the rate and the concentration of reactants and products. We're also going to look at integrated rate laws that show the relationship between the concentrations of the reactions, reactants and products and time. So depending on what it is we want to look at, we're going to use both differential rate laws and we're going to use integrated rate laws. And I'm going to show you how you figure both of those out in the following lectures. A net reaction rate is the if you may, it's a comparison between the forward rate and the reverse rate for any chemical reaction. In this uh, sample equation here, the forward reaction obviously is shown by the arrow. The reverse direction simply shows the products being converted back into reactants, which happens in a closed container. And the difference between those two rates is what we call the net rate. Typically, when we study reaction kinetics, we look at the beginning of the reaction. Why? Because that's when the forward rate dominates. And we don't have to worry about the impact of the accumulation of the products on the overall rate. As the reaction proceeds, the reverse rate comes into play if the system reaches an equilibrium. However, we can ignore that if the reaction goes to completion. When does that happen? When the equilibrium value is a large number, we can then uh, assume the reverse rate has no impact. And that's the type of situation that we are going to study in this course, for the most part, when we talk about reaction kinetics, just to keep things simpler. As you proceed through your engineering studies and further years, you are gonna deal with more complex scenarios. So the reaction rate, depends on the concentration of reacting molecules. It's common sense that as you increase the number of reacting molecules, the probability of collision in a, in a container of limited size of, of, of uh, volume that is not changing depends on how many reacting molecules there are. The more molecules there are, the greater the probability of collision, the greater the reaction rate. Now consider this reaction again, BrNO changing to Br2 and NO. We know from what we've just discussed that the rate is one over minus two dBrNO dt for the consumption of BrNO. We can also assume that that rate is proportional to some constant times the concentration of BrNO raised to some power. Please don't make this mistake. A rate expression cannot be determined looking at a balanced chemical equation. Why is that? It's because we don't really know what the mechanisms are in this reaction. This reaction could very well be occurring in steps that this overall equation isn't showing. To find the reaction expression, rate expression, we have to look at data for this particular reaction happening in different um, trials. And I'm going to show you that in the next lecture. For now, simply understand that all rate expressions or rate laws are going to equal some kind of constant, which I'm going to show you how to figure out, times the concentration of the reactant to some power. And that power can vary. That power can be zero or one or two, even three. There's some terms we can use to describe this rate expression. We can say, again, we already mentioned K, which is the reaction constant that depends on different factors. 
like temperature, the characteristics of the molecules. And we can also talk about a reaction order. The reaction order is the exponent in this equation. The value of n has nothing to do with the stoichiometry of the reaction. Like I said, it has to do with intermediate steps that we can kind of uh, predict based on uh, observations we make when we look at reactions in progress and look at what happens as we change concentrations. How does that impact on the rate of reaction? And I mentioned again that the reaction order can be zeroth order, first order, second order, et cetera. So considering in a general equation like this, the reactants are A and B, the products are C and D, instantaneous rates can be determined by looking at the change in A and the, <clears throat> the coefficient in A is, is uh, little a. So again, the uh, reaction rate would be one over minus A because it's being consumed, dA, dt. Or we could look at B, in which case, the change in the concentration of B is one over minus B, dB, dt, or we could look at C, or we could look at D. And we know, since there are two reactants present here, that the rate of the reaction is going to be dependent on each of these reactants, potentially. We might find out from analysis that it only depends on one or the other, dependent on the intermediate steps that we don't really know about. But that I will show you in the next lecture. For now, let's assume that the reaction order is based on the exponents in this equation, the differential rate law expression. Again, we know the differential rate law expression is based on rates that are determined from tangents, if we may, at, at, at graphs that are drawn. So the instantaneous individual rates will be, will be negative for the reactants because they're being consumed. When we take the weighting factors into account, the overall rates will be positive because the weighting factor here is minus. Minus divided by minus is a positive. So the rate in this case, in this rate expression, this differential rate expression, we can say that it's <clears throat> the m order with respect to a, it's the nth order with respect to b. So to get the total reaction order for this reaction, we would add those two exponents together. So for instance, if it was first order with respect to M and second order with respect to N, the reaction order would be three. So consider this reaction again. Let's write the overall rate expression in terms of the rate of consumption of NO, the rate of consumption of O2, and the rate of production of NO2, reactants changing in the products. We write the overall rate expression in terms of the concentrations of the reactants only. The differential rate expression is not based on the products, just on the reactants. The reaction order is going to have to be determined for NO and O2. We can't get it from the balanced chemical equation. We have to get it from data. So the rate in terms of NO would be 1 over minus 2, the weighting factor here being minus 2 for NO, dNO over dt. The rate in terms of O2 would be one over minus one because it's being consumed, DO2, DT. And the rate in terms of NO2 would be one over two, DNO2, DT. So the differential rate expression is only based on the reactants. And we know the reaction order, it's mth order with respect to NO, nth order, with respect to O2, we don't know the values of M and N, so we're going to need data because there might be intermediate steps required to determine this. We go into that in detail in the next lecture. So thank you very much for staying tuned, and we will see you next time. Bye for now. Take care. Good luck on your uh, upcoming quiz. Make sure you prepare for it. Do all the homework questions that are assigned. Make sure you understand how they're done, and then you'll be fine. Thank you. Bye now.